Okay, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the session uh, on finance, sustainability, and the environment. You have everyone's bios in the book, so I'm not going to spend uh, any time introducing them. Uh, but I'm delighted that we've got three really great people to help us think about this and look forward to um, a good discussion. There are not that many of us, which means we'll sure be able to have a much richer discussion for it. Um, so let's begin uh, in the order that they're here. Cameron Hepburn, Professor at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Market School, which I'm proud to be the director of. Thank you. To all of you for uh, being here, I realise that it's a smorgasbord of interesting things going on and uh, um, thank you to INET as well for hosting this session, which I think is, um, you know, even though the broad topic of this meeting is on inequality, it is important that we keep thinking about some of these other pressing challenges that might uh, undermine the basis for human civilization. and then if we're all equally dead, uh, it doesn't matter so much. So um, I'm going to be talking about peak atmosphere and the issue of the moment, in a way, which is the fossil fuel divestment campaign, uh, which is kind of the, the big item on finance and the environment at the moment. And if we step back for a minute and think about the big themes uh, coming out of the last day or two. Um, it's really been one of a global economy that is failing to do capital allocation particularly well across a whole range of sectors. And I think the environment is no exception there. We are not allocating our capital well, as you'll see in a moment. We spend uh, roughly half a trillion on fossil fuel exploration production. We spend roughly half a trillion on fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, so a trillion all up. It's come down, obviously, in the last couple of years. Whether that's a sensible spend at the current point in human civilization is a fair question. And it should be compared to, for instance, numbers like uh, you know a couple of hundred billion on the deployment globally of all forms of cleaner energy and four billion globally on uh, clean energy research and development spend. So, I think in keeping with the broad themes that have emerged over the last couple of days, I think it's fair to say that we've got a bit of capital misallocation in this uh, space as well. Um, so what I'm going to cover is three things. Firstly, remind you uh, of some of the atmospheric constraints that we uh, face. And um, I'm so tired of the peak oil thing, I've decided that we should start calling this peak atmosphere instead, because what we're running out of is not oil, but atmosphere, uh, and the divestment campaign. Run through some of the challenges with that divestment campaign, uh, and I'll be a little bit provocative there, and then end with what I think could form part of a better solution. So, uh, if you don't know these numbers by now and you're sitting in this room, then you ought to, but equally I'm delighted and honoured to have the privilege of sharing them with you. Uh, as you can see on the top line of this chart, uh, three bars showing temperature increase as a function of fossil fuel um, CO2-based emissions down the bottom in terms of trillions of tonnes of carbon dioxide. And in a best-guess scenario, you can see that two degrees takes you down in a dashed line to around another one to two uh, trillion tonnes of CO2 left that we can emit. Uh, be careful with your tonnes of CO2 or tonnes of carbon. They differ by a factor of three and two thirds. Uh, and on the very bottom, we, I have stacked up their oil reserves and resources. So reserves are um, uh, reserves that we can extract economically and technically right now. Resources are things that we can extract most likely later. Um, natural gas in blue and coal reserves there in black. And as you can see, we've got a lot more uh, in the ground in terms of embodied fossil CO2, then we can afford to stick up into the atmosphere to get to two degrees, hence the notion of peak atmosphere. And I've left off one chunk here of this chart, so keep your eyes on the, uh, on the prize. And you can see that when we add in coal and lignite resources, it takes us out to about 44 trillion tonnes of CO2, when in fact we've got, as I said, around one to two left to stick up there. So we do not have a peak fossil problem, we have a peak atmosphere problem. Uh, and I, I just, I repeat this because while I think this is kind of so blindingly obvious that it doesn't bear mentioning again, 
um, uh, you know, it's person after person who I meet recently who um, are unaware of this, including um, billionaires who ought to know better. Not, not here, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> I hasten to add. Okay, so where that's led to is a big call, uh, both within and, and pressure upon the finance industry for divestment from fossil fuels, saying, hang on, this is our money and pension funds, we want to take it out of this, this industry, often motivated by moral reasons, sometimes motivated by financial reasons. So whether it's Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, or, or other groups, and there are some in the room, uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion later, um, this movement is building and building faster than previous movements, uh, divestment movements, whether it was on South Africa or uh, other issues of the past. And in a sense, it's quite exciting. The, the, the idea of the movement isn't to um, starve fossil fuel companies of finance. Uh, if it were, it would be a very stupid movement because that is not going to happen. The idea is to stigmatise them uh, and the campaign, the divestment campaign, is, uh, appears to be having three initial effects. It's increasing awareness of the issue among citizens. It's engaging shareholders to some degree in the issue. And it is triggering uh, board responses at some of these big fossil fuel companies. And the idea is that those three mechanisms then lead you through to shifts in corporate strategy in the big fossil corporates and um, you know, a less entrenched support, perhaps, for the fossil fuel industry from governments and a, and a shift in policy. Now, one thing to say is that the movement is fundamentally fairly Western at the moment. Uh, uh, there is, um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there is hope that it will trigger a global response, but I'll just say a little bit more about that in a moment. So I'm, I'll keep this short and sweet. So that, that's it on the, the, the context. So I want to take you through some of the challenges with the divestment movement and then see where we might go. OK, so challenge number one is that the facts are that our energy system is fundamentally fossil fuel based. Uh, if we were to shut down fossil fuels tomorrow, I couldn't get home to my family, the lights would go out, etc. And you can see there from the Sankey diagram that um, coal, oil and gas still dominate the system. It's just a fact. And I'm not going to be an apologist for the fossil fuel industry here at all, but I just want to make sure that we're starting with a good fact base. The second fact, well, actually, less fact, more prediction. Um, this is from the IEA. You can see there in the light-coloured pink, 2010 levels of oil, coal and gas compared with renewables and nuclear. And under their new policy scenario, which involves policies to improve energy efficiency, to shift to renewables, etc., uh, you see a substantial increase in renew renewables there, a doubling. I mean, it's a massive growth rate. It's very impressive. But the fact remains that oil, coal, and gas still dominate the mix, and we still fundamentally have a fossil-driven system in 2035. So divestment of itself isn't necessarily going to change that. We need to make sure that whatever we're doing is attacking that problem and doing better than uh, the IAA's new policies scenario. Second challenge is that um, divestment has tended to, uh, although we can get into discussion about this later, has tended to focus on the potential for removing uh, funds from listed assets. And if we look at the total reserves, so not the resources, but just the reserves and where they are held, as you can see, um, you know, 750 out of 2,800 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide are, are within, so about a, qu a quarter-ish uh, are listed, and three quarters are roughly unlisted. Um, so we need a way of tackling those unlisted assets as well, if you were to um, take divestment seriously. And further, um, from a country perspective, a lot of the countries that have the coal, oil and gas that is needs to stay underground are not countries that necessarily we are successfully pressuring when we pressure BP or Shell or, or other players. You know, it's, it's Saudis, it's Iran, it's Russia, Qatar, Venezuela, etc. in the mix, uh, along with a few Western players too. But it's pr predominantly non-Western uh, players or countries in the top ten. Now, for my most provocative claim... You can actually argue that divestment is both selfish and unethical, rather than, un uh, rather than ethical. Let me take you through this. Um, 
And I want to be clear here that I'm distinguishing from the act of divestment from the divestment campaign. I think the campaign itself has been very useful so far. But let's think about the act of investment, uh, dis, uh, divestment. Sorry. Firstly, uh, very recent research, last year or so, and uh, one, of, one of the people working on this is in the room, shows that you can divest at minimal or positive, possibly negative cost to yourself. So this is not a costly strategy. What you can do is track an index, uh, invest in a, uh, an index that's been adjusted to remove most of the fossil component, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of it, with almost no tracking error from the global index, so MCSI, All Countries World Index, for, int for, for, for interest. And at least over the last, um, I think it's five to ten years, possibly eight years, the, the decarbonized or partially decarbonized index has performed better. So if what you think you're doing is you know, altruistically taking a hit for the, for the benefit of the greater good, uh, you should think again, this is probably quite a smart, self-interested strategy. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Obviously, it may, may be a good argument for doing it. Uh, but anyway, I, I think there's a kind of... Um, uh, if we think this is all about morality, one should think again. Secondly, how can I possibly claim that this is unethical? Well, let, let me have a go. Um, if you divest, obviously you sell your shares. Obviously, someone else buys those shares. Obviously, the person buying the shares, by definition, is less interested in the carbon problem than you are because they've, they've taken a different view to you. Uh, so you're effectively transferring ownership of the industry that is at the heart of the climate change problem from a bunch of owners who care to a bunch of owners who care less. And I don't mean who don't care at all, but they care less. Uh, and this has driven, of course, the discussion about engagement compared to divestment. And uh, certainly from where I'm sitting, it seems to me that the, the right and ethical approach here is to force those big numbers down, the half a trillion of capex in exploration production down, using ownership as a lever, uh, rather than just washing your hands Pontius Pilate-like and, uh, and, and getting out of the industry. Now, there are middle ways, and, and I suspect we can discuss them. Uh, OK, so what would a better solution look like? And I, Actually, even before I should go on, I should say, I'm not saying the campaign itself is not helpful because the campaign has triggered a whole set of conversations that we wouldn't be having if we hadn't had the divestment campaign. OK, so what, what are some of the better conversations that we might be having? If you go back to the point that fossil fuels are predominantly part of the energy mix now, and they're likely, very likely, to be the major part of the energy mix for the next couple of decades, um, which I would prefer that that were not true, but if it is true, then what we need to be doing is thinking about how to manage the decline of this industry, manage the use of the fossil fuels as efficiently and, and as effectively as possible to generate maximum social good before we bump up against peak atmosphere. And one can draw analogies with the Sullivan principles that were developed for investment in South Africa uh, to think about what sort of conditions, what are the conditions under which investing in fossil fuels uh, is ethically sound. Uh, we're having a meeting in Oxford to start to kick off a discussion and a process uh, supported by the Oxford Martin School on these sorts of questions. Um, we're unlikely to agree anything. I mean, I think the intent is not to agree anything at this meeting. It's to kick off a, a, a process. But just to give you a flavour of something that might be done, um, I've just finished a, a paper with colleagues at the Oxford Martin School looking at uh, the possibility of sequestering an increasing fraction of the carbon extracted. So what I mean by that is that as more and more carbon is extracted from our fossil fuel reserves, uh, at some point, we need to get to the stage where we're not putting any more carbon into the atmosphere. And at that point, the, the mathematical implication is that we're sequestering 100% of what we're putting up there. Now, whether that point is 2 degrees or 3 degrees or 4 degrees, you can take your pick. But no matter, you know, if you think 4 degrees is safe uh, of global mean temperature increase, you are still saying at that point that you're going to be uh, net zero. You know, if you want to stabilise anywhere, you need to get to net zero, whether it's two or two and a half or three or three and a half or four. So at some point, the sequestered fraction of extracted carbon has to get to 
or we're just not extracting any carbon anymore. In fact, it probably has to get beyond 100%. And so the, the, the colourful lines on the little chart in the corner show the sequestered fraction uh, as a function of cumulative CO2 emissions. And as you can see, they all, m m there's a whole range of um, scenarios under the IPCC uh, integrated assessment models that show that sequestered fraction uh, you know, rising quadratically uh, or even faster up to and past one. So one possibility is that the fossil fuel industry get together and talk about um, committing to sequestering an increasing fraction of the carbon that they extract. But there are many others, so I just put that up there by way of example. So let me wrap up before Ian rings me on the bell. Uh, the divestment campaign, I would say, has shone a light on some key issues. Uh, I think it's been very important, very helpful, and we should certainly stop wasting lots of cash on the exploration for more fossil fuels that we don't need. And the channels of moral stigma are the right ones to be thinking about, and they may well be triggering some action. But divestment itself at a big scale is unlikely to be uh, fully sensible, uh, and it may even be unethical. In contrary, the right response, I think, is to engage, and the products of engagement would be a slowing and a halting of spending on exploration production, increasing dividends or increasing returns of capital to shareholders, supporting CCS, switching from coal to gas, gas, and making sure that the large number of patents that oil and gas companies hold on renewables are unleashed uh, for other purposes. Um, and this all needs to sit alongside other elements of sensible climate policy, such as R&D support and carbon pricing and so on. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Cameron. Um, thanks for sticking exactly to your 15 minutes, and um, that lot of stimulating. I'm sure we'll come back to uh, in the conversation because uh, there's, there's a huge amount there. But before we do, uh, we have Rens van Tilburg. Rens is a member of the Sustainable Finance Lab um, based at Utrecht and has played many other roles. CV in the book. Rens, you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to give my presentation here. Um, maybe shortly about the Sustainable Finance Lab, uh, which is a uh, network of economists from different universities in, uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, started four years ago, um, and um, well, what we actually try to do is, is, is uh, feed the discussion in the Netherlands and abroad um, about both the stability of the financial sector um, as well as about the sustainability of uh, the kind of investments that are, uh, are being made. And most importantly, we try to bridge these two uh, discussions. Um, so that's essentially also what I'm going to, uh, to present here. Um, it's based on two papers. Uh, one was uh, released last year, uh, written, um, um, asked for it by the, the Green Fraction in the European Parliament, uh, together with uh, research company Profundo. And another one which was presented uh, for the first time uh, at the end of last year at the conference of the UNEP Financial Inquiry. Um, and that essentially asked the question, which is also here on the, on the sheet, what role is there for financial supervisors in addressing uh, systemic environmental risks? And what we've been doing there is uh, we've been taking... Uh, the macroprudential framework, which is developing amongst central bankers, financial supervisors, um, which has arised from uh, the crisis of 2008, because before 2008 the thinking was largely uh, that if uh, we just looked at the health of individual financial companies, um, then the whole system, uh, if, if all those individual financial companies were healthy, then the system as a whole would be uh, healthy as well. Uh, so we, there was a, a sole focus on uh, so-called micro-prudential regulation, supervision. Um, and since 2008, uh, uh, well, the view is much more that you should have a look at the system as a whole, uh, so this micro-prudential uh, supervision. Now, there's a whole framework uh, which is developing uh, at the moment, uh, and it's, 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 it's still very much in the development phase. And what we've been doing is, ask, is looking at that framework and asking the question, uh, should environmental risks also be part of, uh, of this supervision? So um, I want to start by some of the basics of uh, macroprudential uh, policy strategy. Uh, so the ultimate objective is the financial stability. 
Um, and in order to, uh, to, to, to get there, uh, you formulate some uh, intermediate objectives, um, uh, make indicators which show you whether or not these uh, objectives are, uh, are, are, are being met. Um, you define thre certain thresholds, and if they are uh, being broken, uh, then you should use your instruments in order to, uh, uh, to get the imbalances back uh, within uh, the threshold uh, again. And there is some guided discretion there, um, but this should not be too much because um, in this policy field, uh, there's all a very strong bias against uh, action. Um, because if you do act as a supervisor, uh, for instance, if the credit uh, flow is, uh, is, is, is increasing too quickly, uh, then the, the, the negative consequences of, uh, of, of reining that in will be felt immediately, uh, while what you gain is a, uh, a, a, a future uh, crisis averted, so something that probably people will never uh, notice. Uh, so therefore, it's, it's always very hard to make a deci the decision to do so. Uh, and I think there's a very clear analogy here with uh, climate change, uh, because also there, uh, if we would uh, act effectively now uh, in reducing uh, our carbon emissions, uh, that will give some pain at this moment, uh, in some economic costs, and the benefit uh, of, of avoiding a catastrophic climate change, uh, well, they will never materialize. That's the, uh, the essence of that. Um, so... Uh, how does it look uh, at the moment? This is uh, taken from a report from the European Systemic Risk Board. Um, intermediate targets that have been defined, like excessive credit growth and, uh, and leverage, uh, indicators like the credit to GDP, and then the key instruments to use if the thresholds are, uh, are, are being broken, uh, like countercyclical capital buffers or uh, caps on the loan to value. Well, there's a cyclical pillar looking into the uh, the things that can go up and down, and there is a structural, structural pillar uh, which is more uh, in a linear uh, development. Okay, so what kind of things are uh, they looking at at the moment? Um, from our, uh, uh, the literature on macroprudential regulation, we have derived these four uh, criteria. Um, so um, in order to be relevant for macroprudential supervision, uh, the assets need to be long-lived, they need to be capital-intensive, uh, they need to be uh, of a substantial economic uh, share, um, and uh, if they are debt-financed, then that also adds to uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, financial crisis effect. So, for instance, housing uh, does tick all these, uh, these boxes, um, and that, therefore that's also one of the main focuses at the moment of macroprudential regulation. Um, but if you look for, to shipping, for instance, then it, th those are long-lived assets. It is a very capital-intensive sector, but its economic share is quite small. So therefore, you, you don't, uh, it, it's excluded from macroprudential regulation at the moment. Um, and also, if you see, see ICT uh, uh, investments, uh, looking at the dot-com crash of, uh, of 2000, um, there it was not capital-intensive, and especially it was... Um, uh, it was mostly not debt financed, which uh, also made, the, made that the crisis was contained. Um, so how big uh, is the issue of environmental risks? Um, I think this uh, picture uh, nicely illustrates that. Uh, it's taken from a re report by KPMG, uh, which shows for 11 sectors uh, both the uh, profits that are, uh, are being made, uh, so those, those are the dark uh, um, um, elements, and the lighter elements are the environmental externalities. Um, so what you see is that, for instance, in the oil and gas uh, sector, the externalities are quite large, uh, measured in, 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 in uh, billions of euro, uh, dollars. Um, but if you compare it to uh, the profits being made in the sector, they're quite small. Uh, while actually in uh, the electricity sector, and especially uh, the food producing uh, sector, uh, there the externalities compared to relative to uh, the profits are really very high. Um, well, there's other reports, like by the, from the UNEP-FI, uh, which show that uh, overall the externalities, environmental externalities, uh, currently amount to about 11% of GDP, uh, and they are set to grow uh, without any uh, new policies to about 18% 18, 18 in, uh, in, I think, 2030. So um, we can say it is a, a substantial uh, uh, problem. Um, well, this I will go over quite quickly, uh, as Cameron has, uh, has already uh, shown. 
um, we really need to uh, reduce our uh, uh, emissions of carbon uh, and that means that uh, when we look at the reserves available, uh, most of them cannot be used. This has been translated uh, into a discussion about whether or not there will be a carbon bubble of, uh, in the financial sector, uh, with the Bank of England um, taking the lead amongst central banks for, uh, for, for analyzing this, uh, this question. Um, well, we've done as a sustainable finance lab some, uh, some research on that, so I'll quickly take you uh, through that. Uh, we asked the question, what is the impact of the carbon bubble possibly on the EU financial system? Um, the first thing we did was uh, to look what is the exposure of the European financial institutions to the fossil fuel firms. Um, and um, well, what you see is that the total exposure is um, over 1 trillion euros. And um, uh, especially within pension funds, uh, it, it is quite a high percentage of total assets. Um, actually, if you look to, for instance, the UK pension funds, the, uh, the percentage is much higher. Uh, so there, 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 there is a, um, a big diversity within uh, both the financial institutions and, uh, and different countries. Um, and what we see is that uh, the majority of these, uh, these uh, uh, exposure is through um, debt. Um, and then we looked uh, what could be the impact uh, of, of uh, the popping of the carbon bubble. Well, there are direct effects, so the, the, the effect on the, on the, the prices of commodities uh, of, the, of the oil companies, their, their credit risk. And there are indirect e effects, which are uh, effects in other sectors, uh, like the electricity, heavy manufacturing, um, and uh, very important also, uh, as Cameron showed, uh, over three quarters of all known reserves are non-listed, uh, and essentially they are mostly in the hands of, uh, of sovereigns. Uh, so what will happen with those, uh, those countries if, uh, if this carbon bubble would, uh, would pop? Well, in this report, we've only been looking at the direct effects. So what, what, what will happen with uh, the fossil fuel companies? Um, and uh, therefore, um, it's important to uh, keep in mind for the results that I'm going to show that it's only part of the problem of, uh, of the carbon bubble. And as, and as all the research so far has been focusing on uh, these direct effects, uh, it's just a very big unknown still of uh, how, how, how big this problem could, uh, could be. So the first scenario that we've been looking at, we call that the low carbon breakthrough, um, says that well, there will be a quick uh, transition to a low carbon economy. Um, the consequence of this will be a sudden loss of, of, of uh, value for high carbon assets. Um, and it will be mainly pension funds who, uh, who will bear, uh, bear the burden. Um, and the total loss will be about 350 to 400 billion euros. Um, it's a lot of money, uh, but uh, we concluded that it will, it's unlikely that this will trigger harmful feedback uh, loops. So no direct financial crisis uh, uh, danger here. Then the second uh, scenario, uh, we call that the uncertain transition. So eventually we will remain with our, uh, within our carbon budget, um, but we will do that very slowly and in a very uncertain process. Um, the consequence is that the cost of this scenario will be uh, um, uh, materially higher, um, especially because these capital expenditures uh, being made to find new reserves, explore new reserves, uh, are very high, uh, about 500 billion a year. Um, and it's very high if you compare it to uh, the total market value of these, uh, these listed uh, fossil companies, which stands at about uh, 3 trillion uh, euro. Um, so um, here costs will, uh, will go up, um, but the most costly um, uh, scenario is the so-called carbon renaissance, where we do not uh, cut back on, uh, on carbon emissions, um, and uh, there will be an uncontrollable climate change, and well, it's totally impossible to say what uh, the economic effect of that will be, uh, but some people have tried, and uh, it shows that, it, that there will be a very uh, uh, big serious harm to, uh, to the global economy. So the conclusions um, is that it is uh, serious money, but um, there is no financial stability argument against any climate, uh, effective climate policy at the moment. Um, and the longer we wait with these uh, policies, the more expensive it will get. So um, how then does this uh, carbon bubble uh, look in, inside uh, uh, the, the framework of macroprudential policy. Um, well, we conclude that uh, it actually ticks all the boxes 
uh, that we have uh, have defined. Uh, so in that sense, it seems that it's relevant for um, for 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 supervisors, microprudential supervisors, to take this into account. Now, how might this look like? Uh, we've been trying to think uh, how, what, what kind of intermediate target to define. Um, for instance, the excessive credit growth to specifically uh, carbon intensive uh, economic activities. Um, and there's several instruments that you can, uh, can think of. Um, but I think the one that we thought was most uh, promising is that you uh, come up with higher risk weights for those sectors which are more carbon intensive. Um, and uh, increasingly, there's also data available about uh, specific uh, firms within these sectors. Um, so you can also start using that and uh, uh, become more, uh, more granular. Um, and in the structural pillar, uh, you can uh, look at the, uh, uh, the, the exposure um, and, and give restrictions to, uh, to the total uh, exposure that's, uh, that's within the financial institutions. So to conclude, um, what is the way forward? <clears throat> um, as, as I stated, uh, we've only been able to look actually at uh, quite a small part, I think, of the, the real impact that the carbon bubble will be able to, uh, to have. So um, um, increasingly, uh, financial institutions become aware of this, uh, this risk, uh, and they want to look at it. Um, but what they need is, is, is scenarios that include also the indirect uh, effects um, supervisors will need that to, uh, to calibrate the instruments that, uh, that I've just uh, shown to do uh, carbon stress tests, for instance, with uh, financial institutions. And um, in order to, to really uh, get this process going and the learning going amongst uh, countries, um, uh, our recommendation is that both in the uh, financial sector assessment program of the IMF, uh, as in the peer review process of the, for, of the Financial Stability Board, um, this, um, uh, this should be taken into account just in their, uh, in their framework. Um, and uh, you can leave the, <laughs> the paper there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Renz. Uh, that built very nicely um, on, on the first presentation as well. Ulrich is Associate Professor at SOAS uh, at the University of London and um, full CV in the book. Delighted to hear from you. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm also pleased to be here. And although he, he just went out, I wanted to make start my presentation with a reference to, to a comment Andrew Sheng made yesterday in, in the session on uh, new central banking policies. Uh, there he pointed out that uh, the biggest policy challenge of our day, arguably, is climate change. And uh, so he was saying that central banks uh, which are key policy institutions, need to look at this. And so I want to uh, take a bit broader view on, on, on the potential role that central banks uh, can play in greening the financial system. Uh, I'm, I'm building up, uh, in a way, on, on, on stuff that Renz uh, uh, talked about. And I should clarify from the start, when I talk about central banks, uh, I'm partly also talking about financial regulators, um, and you'll see why. So I'd like to frame this discussion in, in the context of uh, the changing role of central banks. Um, uh, Olivier Blanchard put it very nicely in a speech uh, in 2011 where he uh, was basically characterizing the uh, uh, kind of central banking world of the past uh, uh, two decades as a world where central banks had one target and one instrument, um, and uh, these days are over, uh, because uh, inflation targeting, uh, which was the dominant paradigm in, in central banking, uh, had a very narrow focus um, on, on inflation targeting, that's why it's called that way, of course. Um, and uh, things like financial stability, for example, uh, were more or less outsourced from central banks. The Bank of England is the best example for that, uh, with the Financial Services Authority being created uh, and the bank uh, not really uh, caring much about financial stability anymore. Uh, they've learned their lesson so recently. They've reintegrated uh, financial regulating, uh, regulation in, into the bank. And uh, so there is this huge discussion about macroprudential uh, policy going on um, that Rens just uh, uh, talked about, 
Uh, and I think it's in this context that we, we need to discuss whether uh, central banks uh, should also take on board uh, environmental goals in one way or another. And uh, that's a bit smallish, but uh, this chart shows uh, different tools, policy instruments, uh, intermediate targets, and, and uh, uh, um, policy goals uh, that central banks uh, might take into consideration. And uh, as I just said, kind of in the simplified uh, caricature of, of uh, uh, the old central banking paradigm, there was one uh, um, tool, the instrument, uh, the, the interest rate, and, and one goal, um, uh, inflation. Um, I think the consensus has very clearly shifted towards including financial stability again. Uh, central banks all over the world uh, have become very interested again in, in uh, employment. Uh, some had it explicitly in their mandate, some have uh, taken it uh, uh, on board again. I mean, the ECB uh, prior to the crisis uh, would not talk much about employment now. They have to. They can't ignore it. And, and so the question is, should they also... Uh, uh, take on board uh, environmental objectives. And uh, I just want to quickly run through uh, three arguments uh, that could be make, uh, made, I think, uh, uh, to, for, for central banks to, to take on environmental objectives. One is uh, the financial stability and macroeconomic risk argument uh, that Rensch just talked about. Then uh, there's the credit market failure argument um, and then one argument that specifically alludes that developing countries uh, where central banks uh, uh, could become important actors of, of, of change. So uh, I don't, don't want to talk much about uh, uh, financial stability uh, and, and macro risk uh, because Renz has just uh, given a great presentation on that. Um, but uh, with financial stability, uh, concerns uh, um, uh, being a prime uh, concern again for the central banking community, um, I would argue, uh, along with Andrew Sheng uh, and Renz, um, that central banks also have to, to uh, uh, take into consideration, study whether or in what ways environmental uh, risks can be macro risk and financial sector risks. And, um, uh, besides the example that, that uh, uh, Renz looked at, um, you can also make up other cases. For example, if you take uh, an economy like Indonesia, uh, which has um, a huge extractive industry, of course, but also um, they are dependent on, on uh, very dependent on agricultural sector, uh, palm oil, uh, things like that. Um, if they're depleting their natural resources, so not the minerals, but also um, uh, kind of have unsustainable palm oil production and so on. Uh, this could uh, down the way, uh, down the down the line, uh, cause some big problems of, of uh, employment uh, and and uh, larger problems for the economy. So um, that that could also be one example um, how uh, kind of environmental damage, uh, uh, besides uh, the carbon problems, could could hurt an economy, um, and. Uh, there has been some very interesting uh, research going on in, on, on uh, the risk of carbon, um, of, of climate change on, on economies. For example, last year, the uh, Risky Business uh, Project, uh, which is co-chaired by uh, Hank Pawson and uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, published a very interesting study on, on how climate change will affect uh, different sectors, different industries in the U.S. economy. And uh, so, I mean, they, they painted a very diverse picture with some industries uh, getting a very hard hit. And um, financial institutions uh, who are very exposed to these sectors, um, they should take notice. And therefore, um, the regulator should also uh, take notice. So that's basically the, the financial and macro risk argument. Uh, the second one... Uh, very simple uh, credit market failure argument. Um, you can say, or we can say that, or I can say that, uh, the uh, provision of credit to 
uh, activities that are socially undesirable uh, uh, is a problem. And um, if uh, uh, financial institutions are allocating credit into um, uh, uh, activities they, they, uh, that are not desirable from uh, a societal perspective, and the central bank has tools to, to address this, uh, then maybe um, it should. And um, this argument is, is uh, or can be coupled with, uh, or is, is made basically an application of the theory of the second best. Um, ideally, or in an ideal world, we would have environmental regulation uh, or carbon pricing, uh, you know, that would address the problem of, of negative externalities uh, resulting from, from investment in certain activities. Uh, but the reality is that uh, some things like carbon pricing are very difficult uh, for political reasons, um, but also um, there are uh, some countries where environmental regulation is simply not binding uh, because uh, policy institutions are weak. Um, and if the central bank or the regulatory authority um, can use tools to affect allocation of credit in a socially desirable way, uh, then uh, this would be a case for intervention. The third argument is very much related to this, um, and this is specifically about developing and emerging economies. Um, and uh, in, in many, or many developing and emerging economies actually have quite good environmental regulation, uh, but uh, in some of these countries, uh, the enforcement of regulation is very weak. Um, so again, if I take Indonesia, a country I've been working on a lot, um, the environmental regulation is good, but uh, it doesn't really matter much. Uh, on the other hand, um, financial regulation is really binding. After the Asian financial crisis, um, uh, a good regulatory framework was introduced where the central bank uh, really has had a tight grip on, on, on the banking industry, which is dominating finance. Um, and uh, uh, so the, the central bank um, actually has become uh, a driver for, sh uh, for change in, in this area, and they've been uh, introducing recently um, uh, a green finance uh, roadmap uh, where they want to push financial institutions to, to um, uh, take environmental risk analysis on board in their lending decisions and so on. Um, and uh, in, in many developing countries, if you, if you go to the central bank, you just have to go to the building and look at the building uh, and compare it with the with, uh, uh, Ministry of Environment, for example, you can directly see how, how different uh, their position is in, in, in government. Uh, they have much more uh, uh, power, and that could be uh, made use. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, historically, um, central banks all over the world, and not only in developing countries, <coughs> but also in, in, in Europe and, and indeed also in the US, uh, central banks have been um, very much engaged in uh, supporting uh, some uh, uh, kind of industries or directing credit into certain industries. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, this is kind of uh, nothing new, what I'm talking about. And there's uh, a big list of potential uh, instruments uh, that central banks uh, can, uh, could make use of, um, let's say directed green uh, credit policy instruments, um, uh, and uh, that's actually something that the Bank of England is using right now. Um, so uh, the Bank of England, uh, uh, since 2012, has a funding for lending scheme, uh, which banks that lend on to SMEs uh, get prefer, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, better uh, uh, refinancing conditions with the bank. Um, so uh, similar schemes could be also applied to, to green lending. Um, uh, central banks can make use of reserve requirements uh, which have an uh, enormous impact uh, on banks' ability uh, to create credit uh, and by lowering reserve 
uh, requirements on uh, certain preferred green assets, for example, uh, they could uh, help boost lending in that uh, direction. Uh, similar with capital requirements. And again, uh, if we take, for example, Basel III, that includes uh, provisions already for um, adjusted provisions for um, SME lending. Um, so theoretically, one could apply something similar to uh, green lending, however you define it. Um, and uh, by, by listing these instruments or many other uh, instru uh, instruments, I'm not saying they're all great and fantastic and should be used, but there are many tools that could be used and historically have been used in, 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 in different contexts. Um, one point uh, that's also uh, worth mentioning um, is that uh, central banks uh, could also make a huge impact in uh, when, when allocating their own uh, reserves. Uh, central banks today hold about 8% um, of global financial assets, which is a really big part. Um, and uh, they can allocate uh, these assets uh, in certain directions. Obviously, you know, they have to have uh, certain investments in treasury bills and so on to, to have liquidity, but uh, some central banks have so much uh, reserves they don't, really don't know where to put their money. And um, uh, Andrew Sheng actually wrote a very interesting paper on that um, for, for this uh, uh, UNEP uh, inquiry meeting, uh, which Rance and I attended in December, um, where he uh, mentioned that if all central banks were to uh, join the UN principles for responsible investment and shift uh, their reserves into sustainable invest assets, um, there would be uh, 24 trillion worth of funds um, added uh, to the 45 trillion already. So that would be would make a big difference. Um, and it's not only theory. A lot of central banks actually are doing, uh, are going or thinking in that direction. Uh, mostly developing countries, uh, central banks of Bangladesh, um, Indonesia, Mongolia, Brazil. Uh, have been uh, uh, putting forward different frame, uh, frameworks and working on this. The People's Bank of China, Ma Jun, the new chief economist, uh, has set up a big working group uh, to study uh, macroprudential risks from uh, climate change and so on. Um, so a lot is going on, and uh, probably have <coughs> half a minute left. <laughs> um, and. Uh, so just that you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm completely crazy and want to overload central banks with, with uh, uh, strange environmental goals. Uh, of course, one has to be cautious. Central banks do have other objectives. Uh, and uh, if you try to overload central bankers, um, uh, they will encounter problems. There might be a conflict with, with, uh, different, uh, of different objectives. So we have the famous Tinbergen rule. Um, so we need uh, pol enough policy instruments uh, to pursue uh, uh, a desired uh, number of objectives. Um, there's also the problem of uh, uh, resting too much power into uh, institutions uh, that are uh, not accountable or not fully accountable to the public. And also, uh, given that uh, the central banking community, where I also worked in for some time, is rather conservative in general, you shouldn't uh, overload uh, them. And uh, let me just uh, put this on the wall. I won't uh, read it out, but uh, uh, here's a call from, from uh, uh, Jim Kim, the World Bank president, uh, to financial regulators uh, and central bankers to, to do something. And uh, let me stop here. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Ulrich. <laughs> Good. Well, we had a very rich um, set of introductory um, comments. Um, they're, they're obviously related, but I think uh, Cameron's is slightly different uh, to the two which really focused on um, the regulatory authorities uh, and financial stability. So why don't we first um, deal with Cameron's for a little bit and then come to the financial regulatory uh, series uh, that Ulrich and, and Jenstrom. So... Um, yeah, provocative comments, uh, not least that disinvestment is uh, 
unethical. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks very much. My name's Camilla Toulmin. I run a research institute based in London called IIED, the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, I had a, f a, f a number of issues in relation to Cameron's very interesting presentation. Um, and I suppose, I mean, I'm interested in looking at how you can determine different pressure points that collectively um, put us onto a low or zero carbon pathway. Um, it seems to me that this is a kind of a classic insider-outsider um, piece of work that needs to be done, where you've got a lot of pressure coming in from outside trying to change the narrative, as you say, trying to stigmatize the fossil fuel industry. And then you've got like-minded insiders around the board table who can see how to work to make the transformation happen. I just wonder, though, whether staying in um, gives, obviously it depends on the size of the investor, but uh, if you talk to people like the Oxford University Endowment, they say, well, we've got almost no money in fossil fuels, but we're going to stay in because we think it makes more sense to stay in as an influential engagement strategy. But hey, guys, you know, if you've got almost less than nothing in there, you know, what kind of real influence and engagement can you exert? Um, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you was whether the Saudis were doing us a favor. Is the fall in oil prices going to be good or bad in terms of getting that um, transition away from fossil fuels um, because of the, the pullback in terms of exploration? in their responses. Yeah. Yeah, the, also for Cameron, it seems to me that the so-called divest uh, movement is really a, a movement to attack the supply side, to get investors to divest away from uh, oil and gas companies in hopes that they, they keep fossil fuels in the ground. But I, I wonder if the bigger problem isn't on the, d the demand side. And what I mean by that is that um, really the modern consumer societies that we live in today aren't exactly compatible with sustainable development in, just in terms of energy per capita. And I also think that Ren's chart kind of makes this point clearly when he looks at the environmental impact across sectors. The oil and gas sector itself isn't actually, doesn't actually have a high share as a percent of profits. It's really consumer durables, it's food production, food processing. So my question is, do you know of any efforts, uh, social movement efforts that are occurring on the demand side to try to get people to realize that, that, that consumption uh, and consumption patterns, especially occurring in emerging economies such as Brazil and India and China, are not really going to be compatible uh, with a world in which we, we reduce our, our carbon footprint.
Uh, so good morning. Uh, my name is Frederick Samama. I'm representing the uh, Portfolio Decarbonization Coalition. That is uh, a project selected by the UN to convince uh, long-term investors to reduce their climate change rated risks in their portfolios. And we have to convince investors to do so for $100 billion. And, uh, and, um, and now we have a $35 billion commitment. Uh, it's a comment and a brief question. <laughs> my, my comment is, um, is to say that um, I would say that there are three, um, three areas. You have engagement, and we have the uh, Southern Wales Fund of Norway uh, pushing in that direction. You have disinvestment that you have uh, very well described that is, um, sends very strong signals to the, to the market. And I would say that there is a, a third way or middle way to get a risk management approach to say that in your portfolios you have assets that are exposed to, uh, to stranded assets or to a taxation on, on polluting companies over the long run. And so that becomes your fiduciary, and these risks are not rewarded these days. And so that's your fiduciary responsibility to identify them and to try to reduce them over the long run. And if you do so, then you're speaking the language of the investors, because you're talking about risk management, fiduciary responsibility, and so on. And then you can unlock a, a fantastic um, underlying of $95 trillion, because the people behind the CDP, so people being interested by climate change impacts, are representing $95 trillion. The only way to put that in perspective is to say that it's 0.1 percent of that represents $100 billion. So a fraction of these amounts of money is still a very big number. And these people up to now are doing nothing. They are doing nothing because they don't have clear messages, right tools, and so on. But if you speak that language and you have financial innovation helping them to put something in place, then you can again um, channel, and even a fraction of this amount of money could have a, a fantastic impact on polluting companies. So you, could can, you can call that, to, to take your terms, more kind of targeted and dynamic um, uh, exclusion, because basically what you're doing with some new products is that you're excluding the most polluting companies, but on a dynamic, uh, on a dynamic uh, approach. Um, and you mentioned uh, central banks. Uh, Nick Stern, uh, during the hearings at the Bank of England a couple of weeks ago, uh, pushed exactly what I'm describing right now, meaning the uh, AP4 approach that is doing this dynamic and selected exclusion on the uh, portfolios. So a question now, because I, um, is to say, uh, we, we talked about central banks and the asset that they have, and you could have mentioned the fact that they have a lot of equities, as an example, uh, China, Hong Kong, Israel, many banks have, have equities, or they have their sovereign wealth funds as well. So what is quite surprising is why are not governments interested in knowing what are the risks in their investment portfolios for themselves? They have trillions of dollars between the reserves of the central banks, the reserves of the uh, sovereign wealth funds. Why are they not interested in knowing the carbon footprint of their own investments? Thank you. So I think, um, Cameron, why don't you respond to that set? And then um, I'm going to ask you to hold on your response to the specific question on central banks. Uh, and we'll do a round on the regulatory environment. We're beginning to lose people to lunch, so I don't think we'll go. Uh, the full extra half an hour, uh, but we'll certainly have a full conversation. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, you never want to be competing with lunch. Uh, Camilla, thanks for your questions. Um, I'm going to use it to make a remark about, so you asked about oil prices, um, secondly. Um, are they good or bad? I think one thing that's worth thinking about when we think about financial stability and climate change is uh, you could imagine a shock to the system where carbon prices triple. And then you should compare that to the shock that would be implied uh, in equivalent oil prices or coal prices. And you can note that we've had a halving of oil prices, a halving of coal prices in the last little while. We have you know, near doubling of oil prices and coal prices. And while there is some association of sharp increases in oil prices with um, economic recessions and so on, uh, by and large, they don't bring the world down. So I think um, not to pour cold water on the idea of um, a strong connection between climate uh, policy and financial stability, and I do think it's worth exploring. Certainly, I'd agree with Rents's broad conclusion that, that at the moment uh, it doesn't seem likely to be a huge risk. But, but to get directly to your questions, um, so is the fall in oil prices good or bad? Look, it would be good if it was because... 
uh, clean energy had had such success that the residual demand curve for fossil fuels had fallen, meaning that the equilibrating price for fossils had fallen. Of course, the, the, the real reason it's happened is because we've added 4 million barrels a day to the supply function at relatively low cost from US shale. Uh, and and that, that can only be seen as a good thing if, you're, if you were displacing uh, vastly more dirty coal, um, which it's doing a bit of. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think the, the most good that you can say is that with prices where they are now, the, the longer run um, effects of sinking large amounts of capital into exploring for new fields is reduced because the supply, uh, the, you know, the incentive to explore is reduced. But equally, the incentive to consume is increased. And so, you know, the flip side is we're investing in um, capital stock that uses oil and gas that is less efficient than it otherwise would be, whether it's cars or generating plant and so on. So, I mean, the, the bunch of these all effects, these various effects, I think they balance out as being uh, slightly negative in the short term, possibly okay in the long term, but it's fairly complicated. Um, and then on the insider outsider point and, and what's often called social acupuncture, finding pressure points in the system. Um, I mean, I think, look, if, if, you're, a, if you're a trivially small investor uh, with no influence at all, I don't think it's unethical for you to get out. You might as well get out and make more money on clean uh, technologies. And frankly, if you can do it, um, it, you know, it, it, you've got to think about these things in terms of general equilibrium. If you get out and, and you put that money into clean energy and the person getting in hasn't withdrawn it from clean energy, they've withdrawn it from some other dirty bit of the industry and then the knock-on effects of that are such that, you know, net, we've got a reallocation towards a sector that requires it, then, you know, all for the better. Um, but I think if you're a big player and you actually do have some scope to influence or if you're a small player and you could form a consortium uh, and your voice is perhaps louder than your money, um, then you should think hard before just washing your hands of, of the question. Um, then your question uh, about the uh, demand side, you know, all of this is about the supply side. Uh, and what social movements do we have, if any, on the demand side to reduce emissions? And the, the one that springs to mind most prominently for me is the, the meat movement, uh, Meat Free Fridays, or uh, which you probably heard of, um, because of the embodied carbon in meat. Um, uh, my look for what it's worth, my view is that... Um, we should do all the energy efficiency we can. We should do all, you know, these movements are great. And I'm an investor in Purpose.com, which is the movement incubator that operates out of New York that's very successful. So I, th I think there is great promise in these things. But I wouldn't, uh, ultimately, we need uh, a zero carbon energy system, which means massive changes on the supply side. So I think the supply side is, is genuinely very important here. Um, Turning to Armand's points, the um, how easy is it to substitute away from fossil fuels to renewables or to clean energy? What's the elasticity of that? Well, the short-run elasticity is uh, you know not good. Uh, I mean, there's not much you can do uh, because these the, these are long-lived investments that take quite a lot of time to get up. And even with all the growth we've seen in in solar, it's still a fraction tiny, tiny fraction of global the global energy system, right? So um, long-run elasticities give us a few decades, and yeah, very high, uh, and that's what we should be pushing for. Um, and then your, your second point was really, where are political institutions in all of this? I think it's a fair comment. I didn't really address them, but they're central. It's a different... Uh, it's a different area and a much longer conversation, so I think you and I can have that offline, uh, if that's okay. Uh, and then finally, Frederic, um, the middle way uh, and the value of de-risking your portfolio to 80% or whatever and, and still tracking the index and so on. Let, uh, just very briefly, uh, before, because I think the second question really um, we can lump in with the regulatory framework. I, I would say if, if your 35 billion or your 100 billion uh, can shift not just out of fossil, but into clean, then we're talking. 
you know, then, I, then I'm getting interested. If we're just kind of shuffling around capital within the existing dirty economy and the owners care less, uh, new owners care less, then, you know, not so interested. But, but it sounds like what you're trying to do is to reallocate and to shift that capital, and that would be very welcome. Okay, great. Um, let's do a round on regulatory uh, systems and authorities. Um, Eric. Thanks. Um, I, I should just first note I'm, I'm you know, very sympathetic with the objectives of all of this and, and also understand the attraction uh, to wanting to work with central banks. They're you know, very powerful uh, players uh, in the financial system. Um, but uh, as someone who's doing a lot of work right now with central banks on macroprudential policy, I have to say I, I, I find it very quixotic uh, and I'm very skeptical um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is uh, actually trying to get central banks to take responsibility for financial system uh, stability after a $15 trillion crisis uh, within very recent memory uh, is proved excruciatingly hard. Uh, and, you know, you talked a lot about the Bank of England. They are way ahead of just about anybody else in, in, in that respect of taking on macroprudential uh, powers. And, you know, I can see why they'd be more open to thinking broadly about these things. <clears throat> we shouldn't have any illusions. The rest of the central banking world is trailing pretty far behind just on that objective uh, uh, itself. And then, uh, you know, the second reason is also the tools. Uh, I, I'm skeptical that the tools that central banks have are actually well suited to doing things that reduce uh, uh, carbon uh, emissions. Uh, the, the types of regulatory interventions that are required don't fit well with the uh, portfolio of tools that uh, central banks have. Uh, and so it would require a very big reshaping of, of the toolkit. And that leads to my last point, which is uh, I think the political uh, legitimacy and support of essentially non-democratic institutions, central banks are not democratic, they're technocratic institutions, for uh, taking control over an intensely political issue with big political economy effects uh, would just be a non-starter uh, in just about any country I could think of. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just wondered if we aren't kind of tying one of our hands behind our backs in a lot of this discussion, building on what Eric was saying. I mean, it seems to me that what we've had is a withdrawal by public authorities of a central role in terms of addressing this, the biggest market failure that we face. And that until we address that, you know, we can do second, third or fourth best options through central banks and other mechanisms. But that's kind of displacement activity away from the central role of the public authorities democratically elected to address the issue of climate change. So um, aren't we sort of displacing activity away from the much more proper political um, movement that we need that recognizes that price is carbon and that seeks to set an extremely clear, unambiguous direction for all of our economies and societies. Yeah. Uh, Michael Graber, UCL. Sorry if I have to step out for some other session, and um, I, I think I have a sense of what I've missed. Um, two, two things. One, uh, to echo that the previous exchange there, one thing that struck me about your contribution, Cameron, was how different does it look if that money goes into clean energy sectors? And I think that question of leverage between dirty and clean, and you'll know the, the innovation literature around some of this stuff as well, you can get a lot more leverage uh, if you can get modest amounts of money in the right directions as opposed to taking modest amounts of money out of a huge pool uh, only. Um, my other question, though, was, was, uh, echoes a bit more across the others as well. But amongst your principles, I'm not convinced about the sequestration focus. I, mean, I think the idea of corporate principles is a very interesting one in relation to the movement. Um, but what about saying uh, you try and establish a norm, and I had a bit of a chat on this last night, a norm level, expected level, informed by scientific advice as to what the cost of carbon should be. 
and that one of the principles is companies have to show in transparent ways they are applying that shadow cost of carbon to all of their operations and taking business decisions consistent with that. Um, I think you get some very interesting responses. And then it starts to build some of the infrastructure required on the climate side to potentially also address some of the issues on the sort of the central banking ideas where I'm interested in Eric's comments, but not, not completely convinced. It seems to me that we, we heard in the central banking session yesterday, banks are, central banks are already being discriminating about how they are using some of their, their power of what kind of money they're, they're lending for what and on what terms. And I can see ways you might construct things which, which channel some of that money in the kind of directions that people were talking about on Wednesday night here, about the, the, the structure of capital misallocation. But I th so it seems to me there are strands all, all go together around here around the question of can you establish a global norm of what carbon prices should be for any institution claiming to take this issue seriously? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think the, 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 the most essential point that you, uh, several of you have raised um, is, is, is about is a central bank uh, the institution to do this kind of things? Because um, shouldn't governments be uh, tackling climate uh, change? And of course, you're totally right about that. Um, at the same time, uh, the fact is that they are uh, not doing so sufficiently. Um, and uh, the analogy that I see is that for instance, in the Netherlands, uh, there is a, uh, 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 a tax deductibility for uh, interest paid on uh, mortgages. And uh, that has been discussed for, well, very long, since the 90s, because the, the, the use of that uh, interest rate deductibility went up very high, um, feeding into a uh, pricing uh, boom in the Dutch uh, housing market. And around 2000, um, it, was the, it was the Dutch Central Bank, uh, so that was after three, four years of double-digit growth in uh, mortgage lending, and they issued a report saying, well, we should, uh, politics, politicians, please uh, do something about this uh, tax deductibility, because it's feeding a, uh, a, 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 a bubble in the Dutch housing markets. Um, and, uh, of course, it's a very political point, um, because um, in the Netherlands, everybody was was cheering about the developments in the housing markets because it made everybody richer. Uh, with this extra money, uh, extra consumption was uh, was 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 being uh, being financed. Uh, unemployment was very low, so everybody was very happy about it. And and that also led to the uh, answer of the minister of finance, and he was saying, well, uh, this is something between the banks and the households in this country. And who am I as a politician to uh, to interfere? Um, so there, then the central bank, they said, well, we issued our warning. Uh, it's up to, uh, to, to the politics to, uh, to, to act. And if they don't, well, uh, we, we will issue a warning next year uh, and the year after that. Um, but that's it. Um, so I think the essential thing which has changed after 2008, and now that in the Netherlands we are uh, stuck with this really high uh, mortgage debt, um, is that central bankers are much more... Uh, um, uh, of the line, saying that there is a first best solution in the government, in the fiscal sphere, but if they are not acting, we have to take that as a given, and we have to make sure that we have the instruments at hand to uh, then be able to, with second order, uh, second best instruments, to tackle the problem nonetheless. 
So that's sort of like the fight that the, the central bank in the Netherlands is, is, is having at the moment with the Ministry of Finance is whether uh, they can uh, uh, make loan to value, loan to income ratios, uh, binding uh, themselves. Um, and, and of course, there is a very uh, uh, um, um, complicated discussion about um, um, how, how democratically, uh, uh, um, um, uh, I, ideally, you would not want to have a central bank taking these kinds of decisions. But it is happening in that field nonetheless. So I think if you can make the case that uh, environmental risks are just as destabilizing for the financial sector, for the financial stability, which is the main task that the central bank has, uh, then they will take this on board. And um, I'm not saying that, that, that I think that from the reports that we made so far uh, and, and that I've seen from others, that that case is totally clear cut. Uh, but as I uh, uh, said in my presentation, I think partly that might also be the case because we have only been looking at a very uh, small part of the wider environmental risks that are, uh, are around and that are growing and that may eventually hit uh, the financial sector. So my main objective is to get central banks thinking about this, uh, uh, get a discussion going with the financial sector um, and, and, and do the studies that will put on the table whether or not uh, this risk is material enough for central banks to, to take a board in their macro prudential policies. Um, and um, uh, uh, I think Eric said the Bank of England is, 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 is ahead of, uh, of, of everyone. Um, I think maybe they are specifically on the carbon bubble, but like Ulrich said, um, uh, this UNEP inquiry uh, has been looking at, 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 at innovative practices all over the world. And it's mainly in emerging markets uh, where you see that central banks are much more hands-on in, uh, in this field. Um, I know that in the Dutch Central Bank, they've just started a study in this field as well. Um, I know that at the European Systemic Risk Board, they will be discussing this topic uh, soon. So I, 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 I'm quite confident that, that, that it is coming on, on the agenda. Um, and then maybe the, your last question about uh, the toolkit to, uh, to use. And you said, well, the, the current toolkit is not, um, uh, not really uh, appropriate. Um, that's essentially what we've been doing. We've been looking at what is the toolkit at the moment and, 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 and what should be the toolkit to, uh, to, to, to um, fight these, uh, these environmental risks, to reduce the environmental risks. And um, uh, I, I think it, it, it only needs quite a little bit of tweaking, actually. So there are these uh, caps for loan-to-value that you can use. Uh, there are the risk weighting, uh, like again to come with the um, example of the housing market um, the discussion is now about raising uh, the risk weighting of uh, dutch mortgages of mortgages in general but they will uh, be hitting uh, the dutch banking sector uh, most severely um, well the same thing you can do for uh, for sectors that are very uh, intensive users of, uh, of carbon so it, it's essentially the same instruments that are already being uh, applied in, uh, in macro prudential regulation uh, the, the, the main challenge will be to find the, 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 the right levers, so to say, of, of what, what defines this environmental risk uh, and then to calibrate to see how, how high should the, 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 the risk weighting uh, be. I think that, but that again uh, should come from, uh, from, from the kind of research that, uh, that I was proposing. Okay, thanks, Rens. Well, um, so as a German, I, I'm very familiar with conservative central banking, and uh, I've also worked at the ECB, and I, I know uh, that, that central bankers, you know, are not waiting for people like me to come and say, well, you should look at environmental risk and all this stuff. But um, as Ren said, um, there are, in fact, a, a number of, a growing number of, of central banks and also other regulatory authorities around the world which are looking at these things. And very interestingly, I mean, mo most is actually happening in East Asia. And in East Asia, uh, country, I mean, the, the other tradition of central banking in a way, where central banking has been embedded in a much broader policy framework. Uh, all these discussions, studies about the East Asian miracle and so on. Uh, central banks have played an extremely important role in industrial development, 
in supporting specific industries and so on. Uh, I mean, this has been completely outside the, you know, uh, Washington consensus and so on, but it's been extremely successful. And uh, the same countries uh, are facing now huge environmental challenges, and they've never really subscribed to this very narrow uh, central banking mandate. Uh, some of them have performers subscribed to inflation targeting, but um, they've never really uh, pursued inflation targeting uh, kind of in the narrow sense, even countries like Korea. You know, they've always uh, um, put a lot of emphasis on, on, uh, on, on different policy goals. And these countries uh, are looking at ways how also central banks can contribute to a broader uh, policy uh, shift away from, from carbon-intensive uh, economy. And so I really don't uh, agree that, that um, central banks in, uh, you know, central banks in, 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 in advanced countries uh, who are of course very busy right now sorting out uh, the mess we are in, that they should, uh, you know, just put it on hold and not look at it. I mean, it's all very difficult. And as I said, not all instruments that, that I listed, you know, are just ready to, to, do, to be used. But, again, historically, and not only in East Asia, but also in, in well, in, in Europe, for example, and in the US, a lot of these instruments, uh, reserve requirement ratios and, and, and what have you, d different forms of directed lending, even though they haven't been called that way maybe, have been used up until the 1970s um, to support uh, industrial development. And again, I mentioned uh, that the Bank of England currently, since 2012, has been running uh, its funding for lending scheme, which is directed credit at SMEs. Huh? And I don't understand, I mean, uh, you can rightly criticize why, why, why has the, 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 the Bank of England the right to, to uh, give preferential credit to SMEs? On what, I mean, what, you, you know, you can, can come up with all kinds of reasons why they shouldn't. But uh, most people would say it makes a lot of sense for the Bank of England to do that. And in the same vein, you could say, well, well it might make a lot of sense to support uh, renewable energy uh, industries and so on. Um, so, so the argument is the same. It's just applied to, to a kind of environmental uh, area. Um, and uh, so, so I, I think uh, um, ideally, of course, um, uh, first best policy should be used, uh, environmental regulation should be used, carbon pricing, all that. I'm not an expert on this. But um, uh, uh, I, I don't agree that the central bank is in a kind of political vacuum and, and should just focus on, on these very, very narrow uh, mandates they used, uh, they, they worked on in the past. Great. I, I, I thought you'd all deserve and get an early lunch, but you're not going to, I'm afraid. Uh, we're going to end on time. Cameron, is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Um, yeah, thanks, Ian. According to this clock, there's 13 seconds before lunch. Uh, so so the, 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 what I will say is that if you think about this, coming back to Camilla and blending it with Michael's point and your point there, if, um, if you think of the system as having a bunch of people called voters who are influencing policy, the policy shifts the economics and then the economics shifts what is able to be financed in a highly linear way. And of course, the system doesn't look like that. But let's start with there then finance is at the back end of this story and you might be tempted to conclude that it can't really do anything. So I don't conclude that. We wouldn't be sitting here if, if that were the conclusion. But, but what I'm going to take away from this panel is that the, the biggest lever that the financial sector and finance as, a, as an area can offer actually isn't in the financial realm, probably. It's going back to the political realm and to shifting people's perceptions and shifting expectations and shifting government policy uh, rather than in uh, directly uh, you know, addressing the financial questions.
questions because at the end of the day, you can pump debt into one area or another, but unless there's an economic return from an asset, you're not going to get repaid, and so the debt isn't going to flow. So at the end of the day, the economics matters, and at the end of the day, it's the policy that shifts the economics, and at the end of the day, you need your support for your policy. So I'm thinking of a loop in that system and fi finance playing a key role in shifting the dynamics around the policy that drives the economics. May I add one sentence to that? It's really one sentence. Cause I, 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 I agree with this, but I think the, the thinking that I put in my paper is that there is a uh, real risk that in the future uh, the economy will be able to stay within the two-degree scenario. And that is a risk, a financial risk, which is not being taken into account now. So in that sense, the uh, financial sector might underestimate what might come from this policy, real economy uh, spheres. Okay, um, just before we uh, thank our speakers, uh, this is one of the last sessions of the conference, so I hope you found it rewarding. Safe travels home, and um, I hope that you feel thoroughly intellectually nourished, nourished and now can do the same for your bodies. Thanks to the speakers. <laughs> thank you.